Welcome to Day of Recordings. August is here. We are recording every single day today. We're talking about the top 10 wide receivers. We're covering a ton of news, everything that's been going on. What's going on with Zeke? What should you do with him? What should you do with the backup situation? So much to cover. Stay tuned. It's an awesome show. Hey, it's me, the guy who introduces the show. Listen to my amazing voice. Now, check out the amazing Ultimate Draft Kit. The guys spend all offseason creating this bad boy, and they keep it updated all offseason. It's got their full projections, breakouts, sleepers, busts, over 100 player profile videos. It's even got a mobile app. Has my incredible voice lulled you into a deep sense of trust and commitment? Perfect. Now check out ultimatedraftkit.com and get ready to win your league. Now, back to the show. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Coming to you from pristineauction.com studios with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. (laughs) That's all I got. What was that? Well, I was a little distracted, too. Brooks trying to convince me it's Thursday in the dock. Mm. Look at his eyes. Look how big his eyes got. I see Tuesday. Yeah, I just wrote Tuesday in, Brooks. I see Tuesday. Uh huh. I <laughs> My voice is not ready to go. You need me to handle it? No, I... God forbid. <laughs> got to give the people what they I'll want. I'll take care of things. Uh, welcome in. We're back. From L.A., the My Guys episode. Oh, oh, what a show it was. That was a blast. I mean, L.A., that, that crowd, they were they were ruckus. Was and it L.A., Jason? Or was, was it St. Louis? <laughs> uh, TBD. I don't know. At the end of the day, the episode, we did it. It was fabulous. And I, in particular, loved My Guys the most of the nine that we brought forth. That mm. makes sense. It makes sense. Today, we are in to the wide receiver rankings. We've got the top 10 wide receivers on the show today. And I'm going to put this in there too, uh, Mike, Jason. At the end of going through our top 10 wideouts, I want you guys to talk to me also about which of that, you know, which of these top 10 guys you think has the highest likelihood to bust. Because every year, that's the most painful you know, if you spend a high draft pick on one of these guys and they let you down, they don't play to expectation and you spent that draft capital on them, you know, that's what will derail your team the most during a draft is those high picks. So think about that and then think about maybe which of the top 10 wide receivers you think has the chance to be uh, maybe the yardage leader. I found some Vegas odds on yardage leaders that I'll bring forth as well. And so we'll go through our top 10 wideouts today. Got a great quick question. A couple of reminders. First of all, congratulations to Curtis. Oh, oh Curtis. Curtis. You did it, buddy. Curtis M to further qualify. Whoa, whoa. I like So all the Curtises out there first. Curtis Martin? Uh, oh, I thought he was going Curtis. Mm. Mm. Uh, is, yes. Mm. Curtis won the Mahomes jersey. On the website. So the autographed Mahomes jersey. Curtis has been emailed. So if you're a Curtis M out there and you have not received an email, you are uh, not a winner. Not the mm, we're looking for. Check your spam folder, though. (laughs) Yeah, do that. (laughs) Every Curtis out there. (laughs) Uh, We'll do another giveaway this month. We don't have it figured out just yet, but we'll do another autographed merch giveaway. We're here five days a week. This is the first day where we're into the regular season routine. How does it feel? It feels great. I miss getting into the studio early, flipping them on and recording, <laughs> the, the flipping the mics and the cameras thought, on and recording. And flipping them off. Starting your day the right Let's way. Let's go. The fantasy footballers. <laughs> um, you heard the intro. You can check out the Ultimate Draft Kit at ultimatedraftkit.com. Drafts are coming quickly. 100-plus player profile videos. We're also partnered with St. Jude this year. A dollar of every UDK sold goes directly to St. Jude. We've got the mobile app. We just made an update to the mobile app yesterday. 
where people have been asking for the league settings, uh, like an ADP data change so that you can see what the average draft position is for a six-team or an eight-team or an, a ten-team league. Even a two-team. <clears throat> Even a two-team. Mm. The math does work for that. But you can only in the app, you can change your league settings. I got Mahomes in the 16th round. That's right. It was awesome. That's right. You can change it and then feel really good about your picks. Um, and then if you have your own my guy, we thought this would be fun. Go on Twitter. We're on Twitter at the FF Ballers. Use the hashtag my guy. Let us know who your guy is for 2019. We we brought forth our nine favorites on the show yesterday, but we'd love to hear from you. It's like when you're traveling <laughs> west and you're putting that flag in the ground saying, "This is this is my land now." That's the my guy. Tell us who you're planting your flag on. I want to know how many people are going to if you come to my land of carry on Johnson. Uh, plenty, plenty. Yeah. Well, it, it'll be very, very robust, very dense population in the land of carry on. Do you think that carry on will get the goal line work? I think he will get enough goal line work. I, I don't think it's going to be any one. Uh, C.J. Anderson will be involved sometimes, but that, carry on that will, will get plenty. If he gets the, if he can earn the goal line work, that would be pretty cool. He, I think he got two carries inside the ten last year. Yeah, yeah, and that I think that's more a problem of how bad the Detroit Lions offense was last year, and and will be and Dick, you know, that could be a very big problem for him this season as well. But he is, I mean, if you go back and watch his college tape, eighteen rushing touchdowns his final year in the SEC. He was really good at the goal line, so I, I think they will utilize him. All right, name a player you've been changing your opinion on lately. That's today's quick question. Name a player you've been changing your opinion on of late. Mine has to be Kenyon Drake. Kenyon Drake. Oh, how sad for you. Uh, it, is, it is sad for me, but look, I mean, <laughs> Kenyon, I believe in your talent. I believe in your receiving ability. I believe that your body can take the workload, but no coach does. No coach in the NFL thinks you You must have an attitude problem at practice, Kenyon. And I'm just going to say maybe zip it up. <laughs> zip it up, show up early, show up late. Uh, because for some stay, reason... Stay late. Don't how about, show how about up. Don't show up. How, about, how about this? His demeanor is just far too friendly. And they're like, this guy is way, way too nice. Too to, soft. To, to be, I didn't go there. I just went, he's too nice that he can be sure. a starting running back in the NFL. They, they won't respect him. No, so, fantasy too nice. point, no fantasy points for nice. Yes. Yeah, so coming into this offseason, I believe based on the talent and the opportunity, the fact they didn't bring in another running back in, that Kenyon Drake would have the opportunity to be a three-down back as the pro, um, as the lion's share in this committee, and it seems like based on what we've seen in training camp, this isn't coach speak, this isn't fluff, or just beat reporters saying what they think is going to happen. The only news that has come out of Miami were just practice snaps, uh, you know, live streaming of who's on the field when they're on, and Kalen Balage was getting the the first crack at first team, both on the goal line and in other drills. So Kenyon Drake is not the guy there. That has been established. That's not to say he can't end the season as the better back. He certainly should, but he's not going to be a three-down back the way I hope. So my opinion has changed drastically on him. I saw him as a guy who was a top 15 running back who had the chance to be uh, an RB1 at the end of the year that was going as a mid-round guy. I don't see that as, as a possibility now. All right, I'll throw out Christian Kirk. I am rising on Christian Kirk, wide receiver for the Arizona Cardinals, was a rookie last year on an offense that was pathetic when it came to everything. Num number of plays run. Yeah, I uh, <laughs> when it came to playing the NFL. Yeah, they were the worst offense in football since the 2012 Arizona Cardinals, according to J.J. Zacharyson. Um, so it was bad in Arizona, and and yet Kirk, before he he had the injury was actually a pretty good player. He seems to be separating himself from the rest of the wide receivers in Arizona. You're talking all the rookies, Isabella, Butler, uh, Keyshawn. Keyshawn. And so, and Kirk has such a history. He's the wide receiver equivalent experience-wise of Kyler on the offensive side of the ball working in the K Cliff Kingsbury system. He already knows what to do. He's a, a player that 
can make uh, big time plays. We saw it last year, even with Josh Rosen. So I think Christian Kirk is undervalued in drafts. I am. I changed my ranking on him this morning. He is above Larry Fitzgerald by uh, a decent amount. So I think Kirk is going to have a, a potentially breakout season. He certainly has more upside than Larry, <laughs> in my opinion. Like Larry's probably safer in the offense, but back when we were watching tape on Kirk in college, we, we threw out the name a couple times. He looked like Nightcrawler because you would see him lined up on the left side, and then all of a sudden he would just teleport somewhere on the field and be wide open. The player I want to highlight, I'm changing my opinion, Daryl Henderson, and this is simply because of where he is being drafted and all the news that is coming out that he is great. He is, in my opinion, easily the second best running back on the team, but it's going to take some time. Those unofficial depth charts, which you must always take with a grain of salt that first come out, he, he's behind John Kelly. He's behind Ooh. Justin Davis. He is fifth. He will work his way up, I believe, to the third player. But Malcolm Brown is there. This is why we talk about drafting a handcuff. We can be so sure that the talent of Daryl Henderson will, if something happened to Todd Gurley, he will rise up and he will seize the moment. He's not throwing away his shot. But then you forget that Malcolm Brown is there and just might be the guy who gets far more work. And, and Malcolm Brown is not being drafted. Meanwhile, people are taking Daryl Henderson in those mid to late rounds. I think there's a big difference in playing the complementary role to Todd Gurley if they reduce his workload but Gurley's healthy and he's just being the efficient Todd Gurley than if Gurley was out for Daryl Henderson and the potential for that. Like Brown, they trust Malcolm Brown. Right. They've done nothing but speak highly of him, and then they go out and match the contract offer. We've brought that up repeatedly. He's the kind of player where if something, you know, if you start to see more of a rotation, there'll be Daryl Henderson owners that are going to be like, why isn't he on the field? It'll be Malcolm Brown for yeah, a and, lot of that. <laughs> it's, and it's crazy, too. We, you know, we were uh, we were in California hopping in some of the, the draft best ball uh, leagues in the, you know, the, the giant uh, $3.5 million tournament. I mean, Daryl Henderson is going so early, and and Malcolm Brown, I got in the sixteenth round. He's basically he might have gone undrafted because it makes no sense. He is currently the backup. The thing, why people are taking him there is because if, like I said, if Gurley is to miss a lot of time and Henderson receives that starting job, then he would be he'd be out of control. He's easily a top ten back, but the Malcolm Brown Malcolm Brown issue. It exists, and it should not be ignored. I do have Gurley at five in my running back rankings now, and we'll obviously have our running back top ten show with all of ours, but I'm mentioning it because that's higher than I've had him all off season. But I think he can be the fifth best running back because of that offense, even with a significantly lower workload. 230 carries is where I have him. I don't know oh, if that's ambitious. No, no, I, I certainly agree. Like, I don't have a problem with the ranking of five. Where where I have him ranked is simply... And Melvin Gordon's holding out right now. Too. Yeah, yeah. Is the the arthritic knee at at any moment, just after, after a game, if it swells up, okay, now Gurley is gone for a few weeks while they sit and wait for it, for it to, to return to playable action. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 not without risk. I mean, we talked on the My Guys show about whether you'd rather have Carry On or Gurley in a dynasty yeah. in a dynasty startup right now. Carry On twenty two, Gurley twenty five years old. And you guys threw out a couple couple Twitter polls it as was, well. It was great because Jason put a poll up, and amazingly, sixty five percent of people chose Carry On Johnson, which we just interpreted. That means that it's it's, it's, just it's my truther. audience, my Carry On truthers. Yeah. So, Andy, you needed to put a pull-up so we could get a fair and yeah. honest take. Yeah, and it was 65% yeah, for, for Carry on, on Johnson. An update so. to everyone that listened to the LA Live show, I did offer the trade, and it did get rejected. So he, uh, the other owner it's of on Carry the on out there, is on the 65 side. If you had had the players on opposite teams and you offered it, it would also have been rejected. 100% true. <laughs> All right, let's get into the news. News and notes from around the league presented by Sleeper. 
All right, we have to touch on this. The news this morning about Ezekiel Elliott once again. You know, representatives for Ezekiel Elliott have come out and said that he will not play without a new contract. This was reported by ESPN's Josina Anderson on Tuesday, and she, she's an incredible follow. All the news she breaks, uh, I believe. You know, sometimes you don't yeah, know. Yeah, you yeah. don't know out yeah. there. Um, but the source, her source, also said. You know, they don't believe it's likely the holdout will continue into the regular season because they believe Jerry Jones wants to get a new deal done. But now the Cowboys, they literally, they're staring down three players right now. It's mm -hmm. not just Zeke. Uh, Dak is on a walk year. Cooper's on a walk year. Zeke says he won't show up until he has a new contract, regardless of the fines. And honestly, this is a problem. he's so, you know, he's so important to the offense. These fines don't matter to him. Is there a chance this goes into the regular season like this report alludes to where you could have even if it's a game or two? Because, I, you know, Jerry Jones has come out and said he's not setting a deadline on getting this thing done. They Apparently all three of those players have top five offers on the table right now. Nobody's taking it. Uh, I know Zeke wants Todd Gurley level money, and that's not what the Cowboys want to pay. If anything, Todd Gurley has shown maybe it's a, it's, it's a <laughs> risky move to pay that. Um but from a fantasy perspective, I remember last year, early in the offseason, it's very hard to go back and remember how it felt with Le'Veon Bell. But Le'Veon Bell was safe. He was going to be he there. He was going to show up. There he was said no he was, worries. The difference, <clears throat> as he had said over the offseason, Le'Veon Bell had said, I will be there this year. It's going to be my best year ever. And then there were, you know, oh, if he's not back by this week, then this happens and yada, yada, yada. But as soon as a player starts saying, I'm not coming until you give me money. You have to take it serious in today's NFL. So, I mean, I already took two games away from him in my stat projections. Insanely taking wow. two games. Just just because if you're drafting now, he was my number one so running back. You are you statted him with the risk built in of a couple games out. Exactly right. It's not me saying he's good, that that's what he's going to miss. That's just what I think is fair. But what, what blew me away was taking two games away in an only 16 game season, he was my running back four. He was he was still very very high, so it's risky. Um, you know, I I don't know if this means do you draft Zeke and then grab Tony Pollard if you're drafting right now and feel safe there. Do are we confident that that's even who the backup who the handcuff would be? Well, I mean, like right now their their unofficial depth chart. You have Darius Jackson at the top. You have Darius, then you have Pollard, then Morris, and at the very back is Mike Weber. It's a it is an absolute mess. Yeah, I, don't I mean right pa now. Pollard would be the pickup of protection, um, but we're not kind of in the same situation as Austin Eckler and Justin Jackson. You both of those players that you've at least seen on the field, and we're believing Melvin could miss seven eight games. Um, but hey, look, we're this is a fluid situation. I still think he signs. I still sure. think this deal gets done, but it's becoming more murky, and you have to start start doing planning as a fantasy owner. So then, if you're drafting right now, which hopefully you're not, uh, are similar. He's still the four. He's still the four of that pack right now. Well, no, no, no. I'm talking like we all love as of right now. At the very end of your draft, just throw Justin Jackson on the bench. Yes. Just he's he's pretty close to free, and see what happens. Are you now putting someone like Tony Pollard in that category? Sure. Sure, because if I if I do that and I draft right now, maybe this situation works itself out, but maybe I can flip Tony Pollard to the Zeke owner because he's freaking out. I mean, that, that would be another sure. option that you have because if two or three weeks goes by, maybe he signs two days before the season starts. He'll probably be fine if he does, but at least you've got a trade chip at the back of the draft. This was a surprise. The, <laughs> the Texans waived Deonta Foreman. The Colts then signed Deonta Foreman. Um, John McClain, one of the most trustworthy beat reporters out there in Houston, basically said Bill O'Brien was tired of the work habits of Deonta Foreman, wasn't happy, and so behind Lamar Miller now lies a good luck. Just a good luck. <laughs> That's what lies. I behind mean, him. I I don't know these people. I mean, Josh Ferguson, I know. Taiwan Jones is a blast from the past. Uh, the, the, the Buddy Texans, Howell? The Texans will be ooh, adding. Ooh, you look just <laughs> like Buddy Howell. Nicely done. The Texans will be uh, – they have to add someone. They have to add a veteran. They have to go 
see if Jay Ajayi wants to be on the team. They need to trade for Duke Johnson or they they are the however, inevitable cut of Devontae Booker. The, the reports are that they are looking if they add a veteran, it's going to be a backup. They're not looking, you know, the Melvin right. Gordon effort. Those are canceled. It's just a matter of like Lamar Miller is going to be the guy here, <clears throat> and I think when they sign a backup, Lamar Miller will plummet back to where he was, and he was already a value in the drafts. I mean, they they were already talking about before the they cut Foreman that they wanted to find a third down back, so they're going to find someone who can fill that role, which is not been a valuable role sure for yeah th yeah they, so just to throw that out there they just agreed. don't throw to the yeah, I believe running over back. the last five years they have the fewest uh passes to the running back position all right let's talk about the colts um first real quick deonta foreman does it matter to naeem hines or marlon mack no it's it's a matters fine to signing. spencer Ware. sure yeah he could take Ware's job we'll see uh paris campbell has missed a week of practice due to a hamstring injury Devin Funches returned to practice. Andrew Luck told Peter King he believes he'll be ready for week oh. one. Actually, oh. he said he doesn't have any doubts. I certainly believe I will. That's certainly the goal. Well, that doesn't sound great. You know that uh, for all the dog owners out there, you know that sound that your dog makes right before it throws up? Oh, yeah. And you start getting worried. <laughs> and you're like, oh, oh, no. Outside. Get him outside. Get him outside. outside. We all know the sound, and I, I will save your ears from it, but that's how I feel right now. Oh, yeah. I, I here Here's here's the sound. The sound is, that's certainly the goal. <laughs> outside. Outside, Andrew. <laughs> get, get out there. Uh, I'll break down the uh, T.Y. Hilton with and without Andrew Luck numbers later on the top 10 oh, wide receivers. Oh, I can't wait. But here's a spoiler alert. <laughs> They're not good <laughs> without Andrew Luck. So that might uh, that might factor into your T.Y. Hilton rankings. Yeah, it will. Um, I probably need to move him down, but it's just it's not fun. Andrew Luck's so That's good. That's the goal. Andrew Luck's so good. In every metric last year, I mean, he's top five inside the yes. red zone. Uh, Keenan Allen had his right leg looked at by the medical team, walked over on his own. Keenan Allen is fine. So if you saw that report, that's what Anthony Lynn is saying. Keenan Allen is fine. Yeah, people are just skittish about Keenan oh, well, in general. And when you uh, have any player that yes. you get blurbed about in the offseason with an injury, you you hold your breath, right? Of course, because you we've seen plenty of times, oh, a player goes down, We he's – he should be okay. And then a day later, it's uh, they're out for the season. But So this is not the case for Keenan Allen. Trey Burton had sports hernia surgery this offseason. They say he's unlikely to play in the preseason. Matt Nagy said it's not a setback, trying to protect him to be ready for week one. Does this report concern you at all? Would you have liked to see him out there in the preseason? Or Yeah, of course. <laughs> I, I, in general, I like to see all players available for the preseason that is better than uh, not being available for the preseason. And while Nagy is saying the right things, it, it is concerning. When I take that late round shot, you know, there's there's a handful of guys that, you know, are basically undrafted tight ends or drafted so late that I can grab them as my last pick. Trey Burton was in that group, and now I'm probably just looking elsewhere until he's on the field. And if he doesn't play in preseason at all, that means week one waivers is where I'll be looking for him. And I don't know if this becomes more serious because this was obviously the injury he had last season. You know, does Adam Shaheen get a bump up? If if Trey Burton wasn't there, is Shaheen become a streamable no. weekly fantasy option? Streamable, sure, but I'm not drafting him. There's a there's a problem right now in Chicago and in in, in my brain when I think about that offense is I think they're going to be a pretty good offense, but the problem is consistency from any one player, including Allen Robinson, including Anthony Miller, including Taylor Trey Gabriel, Burton. Trey Burton. Um, even you know, not quite knowing how the running back's going to shake out with Tariq Cohen, David Mopportunity, and then like reports this morning that Cordero Patterson has looked great all camp and is running from the running back position, and Mike Davis was added. So. They seem like one of those teams that is on the far end of the spectrum of predictability when it comes to output. Sure. But I do think, I guess maybe all of that could say that Trubisky's got an opportunity, a lot of weapons, but we'll see. 
Uh, P. Carroll said the team doesn't know if Ed Dixon is going to need knee surgery. Oh. And then Will Disley oh. is going to play in preseason week one. Yeehaw! Big Montana. Get ready. Is this news or is this an excuse to have a hoedown? You want to know why it's news, Mike? It's because when Will Disley played last year, he was relevant. He had a reception that was very relevant. You're correct. He had multiple did he have the two? Weeks, yeah. I just remember the I remember the one. I think it's impressive that Big Montana yes. is healthy for preseason week one. Yeah, we will. We'll see, man. I mean, even if even if he is quote healthy and playing, coming back from that injury is uh, is it's near impossible, especially this early. All right, I do have uh, one last bit of news. I want to get your take on it. Both of you so. So vehement to uh, insult this man's past catching chops. Oh, whoa, all whoa, based, whoa, 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 All whoa. based on the fact whoa. that we. No, 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 yeah, no. It's Don't really you, not fair to Mike. Do Mike not is, you put that evil on me. All right. The Athletic has reported that Sonny Michelle is beating man coverage on the reg, finding soft spots in the zone, being used as a pass catcher frequently in Patriots camp. Let's say this. Mike, I know at the beginning of last season you were the opposite of that. Yes. You talked about Sonny Michelle having the ability, and we didn't see it. No, None of us saw it on the field. Uh, he didn't Because he didn't even get an opportunity and then to when show he, it. When he had opportunities, he didn't take advantage of them as well. When you, How many targets did he actually have? Like Same amount as his drops, whatever that is. I'm going to guess he had 18. 11 targets, 7 receptions. Okay. Well, it's interesting, though, because Michelle's been lumped in with the Marlon Mack, Derrick Henry category of running backs – that you like in standard leagues, that you question about consistency in, in PPR leagues, but if he's getting pass-catching work, which sir, it seems possible, that's a th three-down kind of skill set that he, he would be on the field more often. If I mean, so my two concerns uh, a couple months ago when I brought up Sony Michelle as a bust candidate was obviously health is the big one with him. He's never been able to stay healthy. And the other is pass catching, right? Like these pass catching, the, these running backs who don't catch the ball, they can get game scripted out, harder to do on the Patriots, admittedly. Um, but, they, you know, they can they can really disappoint when they don't get the touchdowns. If Sony Michelle were to be involved in that work, you're talking about a clear-cut RB1 just when get he's him on the, the field. Just get him 30 receptions. I do not believe it happens. I still, I, you know, look, in, in camp, they're they're – Every running back is running these routes and doing certain things. I think we've seen on the field how they use him. They have James White. They have currently still Rex Burkhead. Damian Harris has a much better pass-catching background. So I do not believe Sony Michel happens, but you have, to, you have to keep an eye on it. This is something where it's like if in the preseason you started to see him running a lot more routes, going downfield when he's on the field, I would – I would start I don't, moving him. I don't think we've seen what they want to do with Sonny Michelle yet because we haven't had enough of a – he was a rookie last year. I think the strong point is the James White point. I mean, you've got a better pass-catching option, but you need – it's kind of like uh, David Montgomery in Chicago. If you don't involve the first and second down guy, it's like Matt Nagy with Jordan Howard last year. If you can't involve him in the passing game, if you don't write plays to do that, you either can't put him on the field – or the team knows what's coming that you're playing against. And that's the problem. You have to be able to throw the ball to these guys in the modern NFL. That was today's news and notes with Fantasy Football Gearing Up. Make sure you ask your commissioner if you're using the right platform. Use Sleeper. That's where our listener league will be. You're darn right. And those listener league entries, by the way. We're going through them. They're unbelievable. They are incredible. They, in some ways, they hurt me physically because I know that I can't let everybody in that put time and effort into it. And look, it's really your fault. Really? Sure. It's their fault for being so awesome. Mm. Yeah, that's true. If they were worse... I, I was worried where you were going. I could turn them down. Because I, I can genuinely say my heart breaks. I watch all these amazing songs, these videos, these... What, whatever they're making, and it's like, oh, like you know, right now we've got a handful of spots left. We'll announce it in a week or so, but there are way more than a handful of deserving submissions. You guys are amazing. Yep. Yes. Before we jump into our top ten wide receivers, want to thank today's sponsor, Fantasy Champs. You need that fantasy football 
hardware, that gear, letting people know that you are the champ. Well, you go to fantasychamps.com. You get rings that bling. You get trophies that you need to show your mom. You can get a draft. Are you doing a live draft? Grab your draft board from fantasychamps.com. They even got the belt. You want to you be Hollywood Hulk Hogan out there, lording your victories over everyone? Check out fantasychamps.com. Use the promo code BALLERS. You're going to save a little bit of quiche. We all know you're a champ. And if you weren't a champ last year, you're going to be this season. Just pre, pre-buy, pre call your <laughs> shot, get your hardware Babe at Bruce Fantasy it. Champs. We also want to thank 23andMe. Sure, DNA testing can tell you a lot about where your ancestors are from. I'm sure you've all seen that. But it can also tell you a lot about your uh, health and the traits that you have. And they keep adding more and more information there. You can understand more about yourself and inform your life moving forward with 23andMe's health and ancestry service. I did this many years ago. It's proven very valuable multiple times over the last few years. It also gives you all of your data, and there are a lot of services where you can import your 23andMe data and get even more information. Uh, the right personal health plan starts with the right data, and they have 125 personalized genetic reports on your health traits and more insights about your DNA. You can build out a health plan, help you understand genetic predisposition to different things. And uh, look, 23andMe reports do not diagnose disease or describe overhaul likelihood of developing a disease, but they can give you more information. And uh, they test selected genetic variants only. Visit 23andMe.com slash footballers for more important test information. Order your health and ancestry kit at 23andMe.com slash footballers, and you can meet your genes in 125-plus personalized genetic reports. That's the number, 23andMe.com slash footballers. You guys ready to talk wideouts? Let's do it. Wide receivers. All right. A couple reminders. We are jumping into the top 10 wide receivers right now, but this is our consensus half point per reception rankings. All of these rankings are based on us individually statting the players out. So these are the real season long numbers that we're projecting for them. And obviously, when you talk about the top 10, you are splitting hairs at the top because these are the top 10. These are the best players. Um, but so if we say some negative things about certain players, it's trying to give the other side of the coin as to how we make decisions between them. Not all of these great worthy players can be number one. In fact, only one can. So when they fall to Very two astute. and three, thank you. Um, when they fall to two and three, yeah, it's not an indictment that they are wor Oh, he's so much worse if than we, that number one ranked guy. Can we rank all the wideouts number one and then just be right? I think that would make us wrong. I think end, we'd be, we would be Ooh, right about one of them. That's true. Um, and a reminder, you know, good offenses matter. Opportunities matter. Changes of situation matter. Um, and there's a handful of those guys in the top ten as well. A lot of touchdown variation between wide receivers, certain players that maybe don't have the volume. You know, they don't get the touchdowns. They're not going to be in that category. But number one, he's number one on my board, number two on Jason's, number three on Mike's. Again, splitting hairs. It's DeAndre Hopkins, his current average draft position is the wide receiver one. Last year, his consistency rank was number two. His season finish was number two. What can you say about DeAndre Hopkins that hasn't been said? Man, what can that you hasn't been said? Uh, <laughs> He's got a perfect 99 Madden rating. He had yeah, that says a lot. Three fewer points per game when Kiki QT was playing. So if you worry, if you're splitting the hairs at the top of the draft. And you look at you know the, the the top three or four guys. You're trying to tie break. Maybe that's the one you want to say. Well, if Kiki Cutie is healthy and there's more targets to spread around, maybe Hopkins is. I mean, with Kiki Cutie on the field, DeAndre Hopkins was great, just slightly less great than when he was off the field. That's about it. I mean, you're talking about a guy who has done it with terrible quarterbacks in the past. Someone that you know, you know, that's one of the worries, right? Is always well. What happens if so-and-so gets injured? If Deshaun Watson, who hasn't been able to stay on the field. Look, DeAndre Hopkins has been great his entire career other than one year when it was beyond bad quarterback play. But, you know, I, I remember back uh, four seasons ago, he finishes the number four wide receiver with trash quarterback. So, yeah, Hopkins is great. All right, number two is Devontae Adams. 
Jason and Mike both have him as their number one overall wide receiver. I have him at four. You're killing us. I know. And why uh, do you hate? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you've you've actually it's a good point. I have him at four. Uh, he's great, obviously. He never busted last year. 100% of his games were in that good category. He never hurt your team, ever. He was great. 169 targets. But that's part of why I just am tempering a little bit on the yardage numbers for Devontae Adams. Obviously, he gets into the end zone. Does he put up 1,400 yards again? I don't know. You've spent a lot of your offseason, Jason, bringing up the fact that the Packers had a historical low amount of rushing mm -hmm. uh, attempts last year. This was not prototypical for them and a lot of expectation out there for Aaron Jones and company in that backfield getting back to a more balanced system so you know with players that are ma maturing like MVS um, Geronimo Allison's return a little bit of target distribution uh, so previously his entire high target number was 121 on a season he had 169 last year um, he had never broken a thousand yards, so career year for Devontae Adams, no doubt. He's a great player. He's number four for me. I mean, if you want to, if you want to make the argument that maybe he'll get fewer targets, I think that's very fair. Aaron Rodgers comes out and says, "No, I want to target him even more." But mathematically speaking, it's not very realistic based on how you expect the target distribution to be and the pass volume of the Packers versus what you saw last year. The two years where Jordy Nelson was basically the wide receiver one in football was awesome. He was still only 151, 152 targets. So I agree that Devontae Adams goes down in targets slightly from last year with more rushing opportunities and better uh, up-and-coming wide receivers around him. But when you talk about who's going to be the wide receiver one on the season, the wide receiver one on the season always has a ton of touchdowns. You're talking double-digit, big touchdowns. And it's hard. That's a very non-sticky stat for most players. But Aaron Rodgers' primary wide receiver one always is among the lead leaders in touchdowns. He targets him around the red zone. That's the reason I've got Devontae Adams as my one because I think if I had to bet money that one wide receiver this year was getting 14 touchdowns, it would be Devontae Adams. And last year, while the, yeah, the, 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 the rushing totals were low, so were Aaron Rodgers' attempts inside the red zone. You saw an over 30% drop in red zone attempts compared to his his average over the last five years. I mean, that's from 110 to 100 down to 64 attempts in the red zone. So there's, there's even more opportunity based off of what Aaron Rodgers has historically done. Now, it's a new offense, a, a new offensive coach calling the plays – but I can't imagine we'll see a world where Aaron Rodgers is only throwing the ball in the red zone 64 times again. All right, number three, we have Julio Jones out of Atlanta. Julio! He is the current uh, wide receiver three off the board uh, by average draft position. Last season, we saw him emerge from a touchdown slumber over the second half of the year. He led all wide receivers in percentage of great games. Those are games that we qualify as 20-plus point games. He had seven of them. Over the last five years, he's finished eighth, second, sixth, fourth, and fifth. What a bum. At the wide receiver yeah, position. He's, he's, it's, it's him and Antonio Brown. Those are the two guys who have given you elite performance consistently for the last five and years. And there's really, based on that, no grounds whatsoever to make – light of limping off the field occasionally with his foot, considering he's finished inside the top six for four consecutive seasons. Um, I have him at two. Mike, you have him at two. Jason at three. So, obviously, we love Julio Jones. It's all about the touchdowns. I mean, yeah. we joke that, you know, his nickname it. I just want him year. to have one year where he has 15 oh. or 16 if, if because he had, it would be a, a record-setting year for fantasy. Look, if he had 12 – 11 let's say he'd be the wide receiver one the issue is that's never been what Julio Jones uh, his modus operandi is not a touchdown machine that the second half of last year you started to see that happening for him so there's plenty of reasons to love him but you're probably not going to see him much this offseason you're not going to see him much if at all in the preseason don't need to and you don't need to. And and if you look at what Vegas projects for the odds of a player leading the league in yardage, 
has to be. Julio's all alone at the top at six to one odds to do that. He has led the league in in yards per game three of the last four years. Yeah. Yeah. So he's he's a machine. He's great. If you had if I had to bet on one guy ending up the year at number one, like he's number two on my projections, but if I had like percentage chance of being the number one guy, Julio's at the top of my list this year. Um does it does it make a difference that he's in that high flying NFC South too when it comes to tie breaking over some of the top tier guys? I mean, you have I mean, an opportunity to be in some high scoring games. It's Tampa. nice if if you are or one of those fantasy players that says I I don't want to take uh, you know player X because the division they have to play these teams six times. Like, well, that that should then you have to translate over that Julio Jones should get a bump in your opinion. All right, Odell Beckham Jr. comes in as our number four consensus wide receiver. I got him at three, Jason at six, Mike at four. Right now he's being drafted as the fifth wide receiver off the board. We got him a spot higher. Um, obviously, he's one of the players that falls into the category, look, new new coach, new team, new quarterback, but same old Odell Beckham Jr., at least in the way we're projecting him. He's also another one of those players that has – he's eight to one to lead the league in – receiving yardage so he's in that top four guys that Vegas projects to be in that category um talk to me about Beckham Uh, what can go right what can go wrong here Um, I'll talk about what can go wrong since I'm the lowest on him and and you know I love Odell Beckham I I believe he's the most talented wide receiver in the National Football League and he has a pretty darn good quarterback, uh, not necessarily as good as the other three wide receivers ahead of him in our rankings here. Um, that being said, he also has the best competition for targets around him. The best, you know, with Jarvis Landry and Njoku, I think that there's, uh, you know, there's there's going to be a difficulty to get Odell Beckham up in the 170 targets. It's not to say it can happen, but the biggest red flag for Odell Beckham and you have to realize it. You have to talk about it because for some reason, a lot of times his talent has totally taken away the injury-prone label. We know he's been injured before, but he doesn't get classified and lumped in with those players who have the prone sure label. he doesn't. You know, Sammy Watkins. Who out there thinks Sammy Watkins is playing 16 games? No. About nobody. But these two guys were drafted in the exact... Approximately nobody. Approximately yeah, about nobody. About nobody. The... These two guys were both drafted in the 2014 draft class, same year. Sammy Watkins has played more NFL games than Odell that's, Beckham. That's what? I had to double what? check that. You better because, triple check no, that. No, I did. I had to double check because I didn't believe it. Odell Beckham has missed more games than Sammy Watkins in his NFL career. So, he is he great? 100%. But is there a worry for either of you guys for injury? Because to me, I do have a little bit. Well, I, I don't really, and I think the reason that stat looks the way it does is because Beckham had the catastrophic injury and missed, you know, all but four games in one season. Watkins has the, um, you know, he's played every year. Yeah, it's every year a few games, so you just kind of get fatigued. There's not the fatigue there because you lost Beckham, and then you, you know, obviously last year you had you had issues too, twelve games played, but it was more of the, to me when I think about interpreting uh, kind of the. The feeling that I have is it's just that catastrophic injury. Uh, and what I like it for uh, Odo Beckham for his upside, one, I mean, he makes his quarterback better. Eli Manning was uh, three percentage points better to his to his completion percentage when Odo Beckham's on the field, and he's playing with Baker, who last year as a rookie thrown into, I would think we can all agree that it was a very tumultuous situation in Cleveland. Had coaching chains right in the middle of the year. Baker starting in week three. Like there was he, Baker was up against it, and he still succeeded. Baker had the second best passer rating in the red zone behind only Drew Brees. You know who else is great in the red zone? Odell Beckham. I mean, this is this is a perfect match when it comes to scoring touchdowns. All right, number five on our list, Tyreek Hill out of Kansas City. Last year he finished the season uh as the wide receiver one. In half point. In half point. Yep. Um, we've got him at Jason at four. I'm at five. Mike's at six. When it was when it came out that he was going to be active and playing, I think there's a lot of people that said, hey, how does he not just end up a little bit higher on your ranks? Um, he was incredible last year. He did bust about 20% of the time, 
because he had these monstrous games. You know, if you had him in weeks 10 and 11, he was the number one wide receiver. Um, but he had games in the single digits a handful of times. What are we expecting from Tyreek Hill in, in year two with Patrick Mahomes? 15th, I mean, 15th most consistent, um, but finished at number one. So maybe this is preferential on the type of guy you want at the top of your board. Certainly. I mean, uh, Tyreek Hill's going to have the bigger monster games. And then sometimes if it's uh, Travis Kelsey having the monster game and they don't need Tyreek, you're going to see that sometimes. But the expectation for Tyreek Hill is simply – that he is a number one wide receiver on the number one offense in the league who finished as the number one in fantasy, you should expect a superstar week in, week out. He's going to be a great draft pick, but he does carry the whole offseason problems and everything that went. You carry risk with that. Any event, any stupid thing that happens out in the world, there carries a little bit of higher risk with a player like that. So um, I don't think you're, you know, I, I don't expect that to happen, but you can't just be ignorant to the possibility that something could happen that way. Um, 27, 20 plus yard receptions last year. That was number one in football. If he's healthy, you know, off the field, is there any world where he can, can't finish in a top 10? No, it, outside of the top 10? Yeah, is there any way no. that he doesn't finish as a top 10? No, I mean, the worst case scenario, assuming he's playing all 16 games, would be that 9-10 range. He just happens to have fewer touchdowns. Have, have fewer of the of the monster games and and disappoints a little bit. If he's the your number one wide out, you end up with him. Do you conscientiously pair him with a more consistent type of player? I think that's a wise choice <laughs> like I mean I I, I imagine Tyreek Hill Julian Edelman stacks will exist in uh all over the place I would be happy with that stack I don't think you have to I mean last year he had those games where he disappeared so did Michael Thomas two seasons ago Michael Thomas was the most consistent player you can't really predict those games he's he's great and I think you you just take him as what he is and draft the best player available I don't think you have to he, like he's not Amari Cooper where you're going, I'm worried that half of my points on the season are coming from, uh, you know, half of his game or half of his points come from half of his games. Be pretty consistent, really. <laughs> um, but if half of his points come from a handful of games, I mean, we talk about a 19% bust rate, which based on these other guys sounds terrible. Yes, it does. But as a wide receiver, 19 bust rate is well among the top as far as fewest in, in fantasy. All right, number six, Juju Smith. Schuster had a heck of a year last year, 111 receptions, 1,426 yards, seven touchdowns on 166 targets. Mike, you brought up at the live show, look, he he's in the elite, unprecedented category of production at the wide receiver position to start a career. Yes. One thing that will help that is playing in today's NFL and being a recipient of 689 pass attempts from the Pittsburgh Steelers offense last year, led the league, was uh, kind of out of bounds for anything we've ever seen from uh, Big Ben in his in his career. But this is an interesting – this is where you start to get into more interesting names in general. Obviously, we know the guys at the top are great. Uh, Jason, you have him at five. Mike, you have Juju, Too low. Juju at five. I have him at six. Uh, he's one of the players that I... Are you I, saying your own ranking is too low? I'm saying my own ranking of five is way too low. They're, okay. Way too low. It's They're, not just too low. There's only four two spots. Things, two things about that, Jason. <laughs> Number one, you have full autonomy over your own ranking, so you have no one to blame but yourself if you believe that. Number two, there are more risks to, to Juju than other players, in my opinion. I know you guys don't share that opinion. Um, but you lose Antonio Brown... I don't expect him to throw as much as they did last year, and I think they certainly will not. Um, and I think that it's presumptuous to just say I know that there's room margin-wise for him to go up in touchdowns. That's obvious. He had seven last year on 166 targets, but there's also room to go down in terms of total receptions and total yardage. I mean, you're not generally going to have uh, you know 1,426 yards is a lot. So. Last year, he was the wide receiver nine with that stat line, 111, 14, 26, and seven. Um, 
Tell me why you think he's more invulnerable than I believe. I think he's more invulnerable than you believe because you have uh, – I mean, you 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 don't believe that the Steelers are going to be as great an offense as they have been in the past. I think that they will be one of the you know top eight offenses in the league. He's already established himself – as a world-class wide receiver, and now you're going and pairing him with a quarterback who will hyper-target a, a world-class wide receiver to the end of the world. I mean, some of the targets that Antonio Brown got, I know it's difficult for Juju to go up in targets, but it can still happen. But the other, and I think the more important factor, is the touchdowns. You had several plays last year where Juju was tackled inside the two-yard line. They call that the had, Calvin. Yes, the that, that one Calvin Johnson year. You had uh, Antonio Brown with 15 touchdowns gone from the team. And it's, it's you know, look, the, the, the team, the city, they have rallied around Juju Smith-Schuster as their future star. Is it going to be easy for him? No, this is going to be the first introduction to double and triple coverage. You know, he's had the luxury of playing with Antonio Brown, but – in the small sample size of games without Antonio Brown, he has been Antonio Brown levels. So what I see is a player who could very well end up as the wide receiver one in fantasy football because if he ends up with double-digit touchdowns, which – It's certainly plausible. It's, it's very plausible. Uh, his target number is going to be high, his yardage. He's, he's the alpha for this team. So it's just a matter of can he get the job done or not. According and I think he can't. Uh, in reception perception, he finished below the third percentile in success rate versus press coverage in both of his first two seasons. Obviously, it didn't hinder his fantasy production to this point, uh, but without Brown, it's it's it'll be interesting to see what he does on the outside against those coverages, um, which he struggled with from a success rate, not from a fantasy perspective. Yeah, Mike, I mean, did you want to say anything about Juju? No, I'm, I, I completely side with, with Jason that I think he has proven himself to be one of the top wide receivers and, and there will be growing pains but by the end of the year I believe he will be uh easily in the, easily in the top eight with with a ceiling of number one he's you know he's 22 years old right now which is insane to think that this guy coming into his third I've never season, heard of that age before you're right I mean it, players at this age that have scored more fantasy points than Juju Smith-Schuster is Larry Fitzgerald in the list? Yeah, no doubt. Michael Thomas comes in at number seven on our list. Pretty comes, comes in with his Rolls Royce at his hundred oh. hundred million dollars last year. One hundred twenty-five receptions, fourteen hundred five yards, nine touchdowns. Um, money Thomas. Just money. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Money Thomas uh, just got paid. Did all that on one hundred forty-seven targets. So put up over fourteen hundred yards uh, with about. Uh, 20 less targets than Juju did. For some reason, people don't want to crown Thomas as anything kind of inside that top five range. And I guess I'm curious as to why we can't get a Michael Thomas season in the 11, 12 touchdown category. Yeah, if that's I, not within the realm of possibility. He finished seventh, sixth, and sixth in his three NFL seasons. Obviously bummed people out at the end of last year, weeks 15 and 17. Really disappointing years, so you're burned by it. But obviously, they paid him. He's an, he's the highest paid wide receiver in football, so yeah, they I believe mean, something about him being an alpha as well. When you said there's something you know that stops people from really putting him up at the the you know in the conversation for the wide receiver one, all that comes in my head is there is something. What is it? Like I can't wrestle with. He's always been a top fantasy option. He is the clear one one for his team. Drew Brees is his quarterback. There's nothing not to love about Michael Thomas if I have to pick my argument and say, okay, well, then why, when I stat him out, does he never really compete with those tip-top players? It's just a matter of targets, right? Some of those other guys can get up in the 160, 170 target range. Michael Thomas has yet to hit 150 targets. Granted, he catches almost all of them. Um, but you know, it's, it's hard if you're not hitting that 150 target number and you see and look at this season. Okay. They added Jared cook. You, Ted Ginn is back year two for Trey Quan. is his target number going to rise this year to a new level that it never has. I would doubt it, 
I still think he's going to be great, maybe about 150. But that's the reason for me is just like if he if he if he finishes with 145 targets, he's going to be a top 10 wide receiver for sure. Can he be uh, the number one? It would take a lot of touchdowns. And we we have seen uh, we've seen the season with Michael Thomas having almost identical targets, but he doesn't put up a uh, an elite a historically elite catch percentage on those targets. We see him just put up a great catch percentage, and that was his sophomore year where 149 targets, but he dropped to 104 receptions, just uh, 1,250 yards about. That's that's the problem where he has to play at a at a pace that even as great as Michael Thomas is, I think him being at the 85% catch range on 150 targets, it's it's not going to happen again. So that that's that's where the problem is. I think we have seen him at the top of his receptions, the touchdowns. That that that's the questionable mark. But I, I just don't see him being that 11 plus touchdown guy. All right, I don't. Man, I can't imagine him not receiving the same target totals this year than he. Yeah, we're, we're well, not the arguing. Targets that. will be there. The targets yes. he'll be 145 to 150 targets for sure. It's just can he can he walk away with 125 receptions or 105 or uh, yeah. All right, T.Y. Hilton comes in at number eight. I have him at seven. Mike at eight. Jason at thirteen. Uh, Hilton has had a very interesting career uh, attached a lot to what quarterback has thrown him in the football. The numbers last year are kind of insane. Um, when, when he's been with Andrew Luck over his career, he, ha he averages 80 receptions for 1,300 yards and seven touchdowns. Without Andrew Luck, he averages 60 receptions, 982 yards, and four touchdowns. <sighs> last year, from week 11 on, he was on pace for 107 receptions and 1,920 yards with Andrew Luck over the back half of the year when he was also limping. So the upside is great. He's, we've seen a season where he's been the number five overall fantasy wide receiver, but um, his health, Andrew Luck's health, what this offense looks like, that's the question mark. If you know, I'll answer this question early. If there's one guy in the top ten that I worry about having a bust season, it's T.Y. Hilton because he doesn't lean on 125 receptions for his baseline. That being said, he also doesn't lean on 10 touchdowns to be relevant. He's not going to be a guy that scores in double digits. He never does. Um, if he ever did, he, you're talking about a top three type of player. So Hilton this year, what do you guys think? How much of this is kind of murky due to the Andrew Luck situation? <laughs> I was saying, it, I don't, you can't even really talk about T.Y. Hilton without talking about Andrew Luck. And Andrew Luck is the key to everything for Hilton where – uh, 2017, Hilton was wide receiver 25. Right before that, that's when he was sensational. So it's it, this is all about Andrew Luck to me. And per Matthew Betts, who is one of our writers, this is specifically for Andrew Luck, calf strains have one of the highest recurrence rates. So it's, it, it's very hard at this point to rally behind Andrew Luck as – one being completely himself if he does manage to play all 16 and two percentage chance that he doesn't actually play all 16. Uh, so I've, I've still got T Y Hilton. I obviously I've got him the lowest at wide receiver 13. That is him being statted out with Andrew Luck. I mean, we've seen a lot of games with Andrew Luck and some of them in, in certain spurts of certain seasons have been outrageously productive. Some have been uh, less productive, but essentially his 16 game pace in games when playing with Andrew Luck is about 1,260 yards and seven touchdowns per every 16 games he plays with Andrew Luck. If you stat him out like that, to me he is, you know, while statting out every other wide receiver, he would be the wide receiver 12. So I And, and I think that's about where he belongs. I don't see him as a top five guy because I don't see double-digit touchdowns in his future. I don't see 100 receptions in his future. So he is... He certainly has a great talent, a great quarterback, great offensive play calling, head coach, but I don't have him as an upper echelon guy. And I completely agree with you, Andy. Who is the one most likely to bust? It would be T.Y. Hilton for me, who's not even in my top 10. All right, Mike Evans at number nine. I got him at 11, Jason at nine, Mike at 10, his current average draft position. By the way, T.Y. Hilton's going in the third round at the wide receiver 10. So if you are going, you know, Running back, running back, 
you're going to have a decision to make about T.Y. Hilton and other players to be your wide receiver one, which is the decision I've had in a lot of best ball drafts. It's the decision I've had in a lot of mock drafts. I'm taking him everywhere because I'm not I'm not over reading the luck situation yet because I don't I don't think I'm going to redefine Hilton. You know, I move luck from two to five based on the calf. I'm going to if if luck is proving like he's going to miss two or three games, that changes the equation. But right now, I'm just looking at the upside of Hilton being my wide receiver one in the third round. Evans is being drafted at 209 just ahead of him. His consistency rank last year was number 11. He finished the season as the wide receiver eight. He had 86 receptions for 1,524 yards and eight touchdowns on 138 targets. Um, Mike Evans is a great receiver. Yes. We know that. Jameis Winston is an inconsistent passer. We also know that. He's the least, like of all the guys we've named, he's the one, you know, kind of, the quarterback play is going to directly affect the wide receiver play and, and maybe cap the upside. Andrew Luck, Drew Brees, uh, Big Ben, we got Patrick Mahomes, uh, uh, Matt Ryan, and uh, uh, Aaron Rodgers, and Deshaun Watson, and then Jameis Winston. Yeah, you have to bank on Winston being yeah. good enough in, in an Arians offense. Um, just to throw it out there, Evans's career targets uh, thus far, 122, 148, 173, 136, 138. Uh, Godwin uh, emerging in the offense. Bruce Arians likes to throw the football. Is he being undervalued at 209? Do you think that's about the right place considering the Winston risk? I think it's a fair value con yeah considering the risk but we have seen Bruce Arians offense uh, offenses have tremendous success especially with their wide receiver ones you Larry Fitzgerald's career was completely revitalized and brought back to the forefront when Bruce Arians was the head coach in Arizona where Larry jumped up to 145 targets 150 161 all three of those seasons over a thousand yards can't you make the com the case though it wasn't just Arians; it was Carson Palmer. Yeah, yeah, he was of, getting of a competent course. quarterback in the offense. Of course, that 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 does that does factor in there. But Mike Evans has also had great success with Jameis Winston and uh, and Ryan Fitzpatrick, like guys who aren't aren't playing at the level that Carson Palmer was playing at during those years. One thing that's interesting. Because I tweeted out the best red zone quarterbacks last year by pass rating earlier this morning, the one when you quoted Baker at number two. Right. Ryan Fitzpatrick was the worst in football, 36, in the red zone. And that matches with the quantity, incredible quantity of red zone targets that Mike Evans had. He was in the upper echelon, didn't end up with double digit touchdowns. Um, that would be an area that, you know, if things go right, if mm -hmm. they're still throwing in the red zone, we know that Evans can put up 15 touchdowns. That's the kind of player he is. And that's that's what ha has happened throughout his career. His rookie year when he was uh, wide receiver 12, that's because they hit. The, the connection in the red zone was, was there. It flip-flopped the next year and then came right back in 2016. Like, it was Mike Evans being at the top is directly correlated with his success inside the red zone. He is a great wide receiver. He's going to give you 1,000 yards, but that's that's why I think him being at the back of the second round, it's fair with, with the risk mitigation, knowing that he has to be up there in touchdowns to to uh, really finish in the top Yeah, because 10. he's not he's not a 100 reception right. type of player. I mean, he's going to be in the 70s or 80s in, rece in receptions, which means you have to get a lot of touchdowns. He only had one year where he was, you know, 96 receptions, but on that year, that was an outlandish 173 targets. And, of course, he only caught a, a very poor 55%. Oh, yeah! So, yeah, I mean, if he's, if he's much more with Godwin coming into the slot, g gaining some more targets, I think that Mike Evans is going to have to have double-digit touchdowns to be a top-eight type of wide receiver. Where we have him ranked, it's pretty much about where you know I I think he finishes with about nine touchdowns, seventy five, eighty receptions, uh, eleven hundred yards. He's go he's good, but I I have a really hard time. I've seen some people that say he should be in that top tier, literally the top with the other guys. I I just can't buy that with Jameis. All right, 
Number 10 on the list, Antonio Brown. The GOAT, the greatest. You know, quick to put Odell Beckham at the top of the list with a new team and a new franchise. Antonio Brown's not getting that respect. Being drafted as the wide receiver eight. Uh, has some questions about the feet right now, but all the reports are that it's, you know, day-to-day type of stuff. Um, A.B., all he's done is finish sixth, first, first, third, second, fourth. Now he's being ranked at 10 by us. I think things can go – I think he has the a pretty wide range of outcomes in Oakland. He could yes. still, he, Here's what I believe, and I'll ask the question to you. I think Antonio Brown can end the year as the wide receiver one. Do you believe that? No. No. Not at number one? No. Okay. Top three? Yes. Last year, 104 for 12.97 and 15 on 168 targets in just 15 games. Uh, he should be heavily targeted in this offense by Derek Carr. He was the prize of the offseason for Oakland. We'll get a chance to see him tonight, maybe, <laughs> on uh, Hard Knocks uh, as the Raiders are covered this season. I can't wait. Uh, are we drafting him at his floor when we talk about him being uh, wide receiver 10 here? Yeah, I mean, I, I think wide receiver 10 is near his floor. You've got a guy who's paid so much money and is coming in that he, he – there's – I mean, if he gets fewer than 160 targets, then he didn't play 16 games. I mean, he's going to have so many targets, and he is so good that he's, he's uh, I think, a very safe wide receiver. I've got him as my wide receiver eight. While I say no, he can't finish as a wide receiver one, that's solely on the back of touchdowns. I just don't think that the Raiders offense and Derek Carr is going to get him up to where he's been living in that 12, 13, 14, 15 touchdown range. And if he finishes as a great season, 170 targets, a lot of yards, but he only has, you know, eight or nine touchdowns, then he's going to be about, you know, the wide receiver five or six. Um, do do either of you have concerns over the foot issues? I mean, we've if you haven't seen the pictures, don't do it. Not yet. I mean, it, not yet. He's look, Antonio Brown will play through. That's that's what I believe. I, I believe if you had a game tomorrow, Antonio Brown – would be out there even with those feet. He would and, do whatever he had to do. And it's not uh it's not like an internal foot issue. It's not a bone. It's not a Liz Frank type. Right. It, this is just a you know the skin on the bottom of the foot that is has been run ragged. So I I, I don't I don't see big problems. There. So last year Derek Carr targeted receivers at an average depth uh, depth of six point eight yards. That's the second lowest of the qualified quarterbacks, and he only threw deep. On 10.1% of his attempts, that's tied for fifth lowest. So, and maybe that's a product of what he was working with. It is, but okay, uh, we'll see. I believe, sure. It, it, I'm, I'm just presenting presenting the numbers. So, and saying that if Antonio Brown is going to finish, if he's going to have the chance to finish at number one, those two numbers have to change dramatically. All right, that's our top 10 consensus wide receiver rankings. We'll get into more wideouts tomorrow, into some of those more interesting names. Real, real quick. Who's your uh, bust pick? Jason, you said you'd be Hilton. I'd be Hilton. Mike, is there somebody different for you in that top 10 that you think has a chance of disappointing owners? Because if you bust out in that top 10, that's going to leave a mark. I mean, I think Hilton is kind of the easier one just based off of uh, the Andrew Luck injury news. But I will say – to not just be the, the exact same as you guys, I will say Evans. Okay, real quick. What wide receiver led the Raiders in receptions last season? What wide receiver? What wide receiver? Aitman? Nope. Um, Holmes? I'll give you a hint. He just retired as a Green Bay Packer. Oh, Jordy. <laughs> Jordy Nelson yeah. actually led I mean, them I knew in receptions. It was, it was yeah, Jared were, Cook They was had the nobody. Yeah, they had literally nobody is the answer to that question. Well, they did have Amari Cooper, and they traded him away. Um, their third prediction for the at wide receiver <laughs> predict the yardage leader right now, which by the way, um, Julio. Okay. Yeah. I'll you, go Julio. Yeah. Hold on. Hold on. I will take All right, Julio dark, dark, Jones. Dark, outside of Julio, who <laughs> always does it. Dark horse yardage leader out of the rest of the crop. I'm going to take Tyree kill Tyree kill. All right. He's at 10 to one right now. Tied with Evans Schuster and Adams. Oh, I should have gone Schuster. A star has been born. <laughs> yeah, I I'll, would I'll say my dark horse would be Schuster. Okay. All right. I'll go uh, go Michael Thomas. Mm, Michael Thomas. It's not bad. Michael Thomas. All right. Um, we're done for today. 
A quick shout out. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Goodbye. My voice is done for the day. It was done oh, before man. we started. I haven't recovered from. Uh, we're gonna post this video. I think. I think we're gonna uh, post this video, where we had our our footballer staff <laughs> in a foot race from our hotel in Santa Monica for this live show. High stakes. High stakes foot race. Of look, this should not have happened, but it did. It did happen. Look, it's been a long tour. We've been traveling around. They've been doing incredible work. And we said, hey, let's reward them, but let's make sure we're entertained by doing so. So we put some money on the table. Judge Giamatti, Al Borland. They basically had a half mile race. Yeah, a, a thousand feet of sand. You had to, it was pitch black, and you had to sprint from basically where we were at our hotel across the uh, street, across the pedestrian bridge, across a thousand feet of sand, and leap into the ocean at about 10 at night. Oh, who won? Oh, and, who uh, won? We'll, we'll you want to know, that. don't you? All I'm saying, I'm, I say all of that amazing story, b both to tease wherever we're going to post that thing, but also to explain why. I won't tell you who won, but I did a lot of screaming at the beach. Yes. To celebrate the victory, because I was shocked. And then there was the live show. There was screaming there as well. There was oh, screaming yeah. at the live show, but uh, as we close it out, we want to thank our studio sponsor, Pristine Auction. Yesterday at pristineauction.com, a DeAndre Hopkins signed Houston Texans jersey went for 90 bucks. That's a steal. Uh, number one on our rankings, DeAndre Hopkins. And there are hundreds of daily auctions. Check them out over there at pristineauction.com and use the registration code BALLERS. When you do so, you get five bucks. Thanks for tuning in. Five days a week. We'll be back You'll just be back like this tomorrow. tomorrow. See you then. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers.